Good morning, Glenmar. Good morning. So we know that this has to be Advent slash Christmas season because we have twigs in the Spirit Center and the smell of burlap, right? So I'm wondering how many of you might already happen to have your homes already decorated? Yeah. Maybe all of your presents bought? Christmas cards? Yeah, a couple of overachievers. This is not happening at my house, no. Um, We're kind of getting in, you know, this is the start. We're getting into this season, right? This season of busyness and hurriedness this season of incredible disruption. Sometimes I, I think Christmas gets a bad rap. Sometimes I think we get so caught up in stuff, I wonder, you know, are we like juggling Jesus and Santa Claus? Um, hopefully not, but uh, maybe, maybe we are. Maybe we're caught up in a life of busyness and a life of hurriedness and a life of disruption that we find it hard to settle down and settle into this season in which God brings uh, peace. Well, I wonder if you all might happen to have some favorite Christmas things, even in spite of all of that. I know I do. And some of my favorite Christmas things actually are the Christmas carols. And and I don't mean those smolty ones that we hear in the elevator or the shopping mall, no Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. I mean those ones that are actually deeply anchored into our Christian faith and our Christian tradition. Those ones like Hark the Herald Angels Sing or What Child Is This or Oh, come all ye faithful, or even O little town of Bethlehem that we just sang together. And of course, you know, my favorite, might be yours too, is the one that Pastor Mandy was talking about a few minutes ago. It's Silent Night. You know, there, it just doesn't seem like there's Christmas until we're singing that song, that particular hymn. I have childhood memories of going to church on Christmas Eve and, you know, all the lights would would go down at the end of the Christmas Eve service and we would all have our little candles. The pastor perhaps would light the initial candle and then others would come along and they would light their candle off of the pastors and before you know it, by like about verse 2, the whole church is filled with all of these little lights. And it just doesn't seem like Christmas until you have that wax dripping down your finger, right? <laughs> I don't know about you, but I always get my you know, candle poked in the wrong way when the disc thing, yeah. But that's such a good part of it because somewhere in the midst of all of that, the quietness, the singing together, the beauty of the candles, something happens. It's, for lack of a better word, it's, it's almost magical where we sense God's presence with us in a new way. We sense God's presence and all of the cares just kind of seem to melt. You see, there's something about that transforming power of that moment when we sing together and perhaps you've had a similar experience. In those moments, we seem to kind of glimpse, in that stillness, we glimpse God's presence. And the prophet Isaiah that we just heard a few moments ago, the scripture reading, the prophet Isaiah was also providing us a glimpse of what it would look like to live in God's presence, what it might look like to live in God's world. In fact, I believe that he was actually trying to illustrate for us what that world with God appears like, that promise of God, that life of God. You see, my friends, it's been revealed in the past. It's been revealed by the prophets. And we get the privilege to glimpse it in the present, and it will be fulfilled in the future. 
Through this text, Isaiah reminds us of God's original intention for humanity, that original intention which is shown in the creation account of Genesis. It's here that God crafts a perfect world for humanity to live in. It's a perfect environment. It's perfect food, no calories. It's perfect relationship. It's perfect peace. It's perfect. You see, it's a world, Genesis shows us a world that was free of pain, free of oppression, free of scarcity, free of stress, and free of disease. It is one that is free from all of the negative influences that humanity would ultimately bring. The Genesis account illustrates a world in which God and humanity are in close fellowship. They walk together in the cool of the evening. They share a close conversation. They share a special relationship. Everything that these early humans could have needed, everything that they could have desired was provided for them there in that perfect place. And yet, they managed to mess it up. They managed to ruin it through their selfishness and through their rebellion. My friends, that's really what sin does to us. We ruin the perfect thing. You know, if we are looking at that story, I wonder sometimes why it continues to affect us so deeply. After all, you know, if you just read the text, it, it seems rather fantastical, kind of like a fairy tale. Like, like maybe it's a script that Disney or Pixar could get a hold of and do something with, right? It doesn't seem real. But if we look at that text long enough, somehow it rings true. You know, I was, when I was born, my sister was 25 years old. And she is the person who actually named me. And she was a person who was amazing. I had to grow up hearing about how amazing my sister is, okay? My sister is a musician. Music is her life. She plays the piano. She plays the viola. She's an outstanding vocalist. In fact, she would have gone on to a professional career had she not met a United Methodist preacher guy and ended up being a pastor's wife. But you know, she was this amazing individual, and by the time I was about 12, I was kind of tired of hearing about how amazing Chris was. So you can imagine how I felt when one day, I see pulling up in the driveway of my parents' house a truck with a piano in the back. My sister had bought a piano so that I could learn how to play. And I didn't want anything to do with it. I even managed to convince my parents I didn't need no stinking piano lessons because I am Anna, I am not Chris, I am going to be my own person, right? I can dust a piano, but I can't play it. What I miss out on? Why did I do that? There was a little piece of jealousy inside of me that was wrapped up in insecurity that caused me to miss this amazing opportunity for my life. And you know what is really the killer? Is that to this very day, my sister has never even hinted at the disappointment that must have brought her. Instead, throughout her life, she continued to offer me opportunities. Buy me some cool new clothes. Take me new places. Even though I had rejected a precious gift. You know, sometimes I think that that's the way God treats us. 
When we rebel, when we reject, when we kind of go our own way, when we mess up the thing that actually would have been the greatest for us, still God keeps calling us back. God keeps creating new environments for us. You know, one writer says, when he's commenting on the creation account, he says that through it all, God's grace remains, and God preserves the faithful remnant. The few who stuck it out for the long haul and who didn't give up, those are the ones that God brings back to God's self. Indeed, throughout the narrative, God does preserve, God does reach out, God does refuse to give up on. God creates new opportunity and always, always, always calls us back into relationship with God's very self. So, you know, I'm the risk of dating myself, I remember a little 70s song that said, get right back to where we started from. And I kind of think that that's what Isaiah is trying to tell us in this passage. We need to kind of go back to the beginning. Let's get right back to where we started from. This is Isaiah's reboot. He is showing us a vision that even though Israel rejected what God had to offer, even though Israel rebelled against God, and even though the family tree of Jesse, David's father, had been reduced to a stump, it looked like it was dead, yet there was going to be a sprout, a branch that would rise up. There was going to be a new king, that would be given God's own spirit. And this king, my friends, it won't be like any of those other kings before. This ruler will not be like other rulers or other government officials that you have seen before. This new king will not make decisions that are based on self-interest or political expediency. You see, this ruler sides with the outcast, with the prisoner, with the widow, and with the orphan. This ruler seeks out the cases that others refuse to take up. This ruler dispenses true justice, justice with equity, justice with mercy, justice that overturns suffering. In this vision, all of the cruelty, all of the inequity, all of the oppression, all of the self-serving greed, and the disregard for others is gone. So when Christians read this text, <laughs> oh, we inevitably see Jesus here in these words. We are reminded that in Luke's gospel, where Jesus began his own life in ministry, Luke records that Jesus was filled with the power of the Spirit. And as he entered the synagogue in holy authority, the, Luke tells us that he stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, imagine that, was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to declare the year of the Lord's favor. You see, there's a harmony in Isaiah's vision. Whether it is prophesied in the Old Testament or embodied by Jesus in the New, this vision is like a two-sided coin, two halves of the same whole. And those halves are justice and peace. You see, when justice and righteousness occur in human affairs, all of nature is transformed as well. 
In this scene, the prey and the predator sit together. Children play in otherwise dangerous territory. And as Paul Simpson Duke says, these are two scenes, they're like a hinged painting. They're meant to be viewed together. Indeed, the real gift of the Messiah will extend beyond redemption for humans to the emerging of a new, harmonious creation, one that echoes Eden, God's first intention. The intention of God moves, as Julian of Norwich understood, from all shall be well to all manner of things are well. Friends, this is what we pray for. When we say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On earth as it is in heaven. So how might we be able to glimpse God's kingdom here on earth? I think sometimes it happens in small acts, completely unrecognized and totally unplanned. There was a man named Kent Newburn who was studying for his doctoral work in theology, and during that time he happened to be working as a taxi cab driver, and he had the night shift. Now, Kent knew that this, would, this job would provide him a few little ministering opportunities. And one night he happened to get a dispatch to pick up someone in a quiet and older section of the town. When he arrived there, there was a low-level brick buildings, and it was in the middle of the night when he pulls up to see only one light on on the ground floor. So Kent honks the horn, no one comes out. Now, most cab drivers might honk a second time, but they're going to pull off pretty quickly because of all the possibilities of crazy things that can happen at 2.30 a.m., right? But Kent, he knew that there were people who are economically disadvantaged, and they depend on that, on that cab. So he waited. When nothing happened and not sensing any danger, Kent got out of the cab and went up to the door and knocked. And within a few moments, he hears a frail voice on the other side of the door. And she says, it'll be just a moment. So again, he waits. Eventually, the door opens to reveal an older woman, perhaps in her 80s, very, very frail, dragging behind her a nylon suitcase. Well, Kent picks up the bag, helps her and the bag into the car. She hands him the address of the place that she intends to go, and she says, could we go drive through downtown first? He says, ma'am, that's not the shortest route. She says, I don't mind. I'm not in a hurry. You see, I'm, I'm going to hospice tonight. The doctors have told me that I'll be cared for better there than at home. So Kent looks in the rearview mirror, and he sees her, Looking out the window, he flips over and flips off the meter, and they start their drive. During the course of the next two and a half hours, they drive past the high school where she had attended. They drive past the little house where her and her husband had bought their first home. They drive past the school where she had taught for so many years. And sometimes they would even drive past places and sit in silence. Finally, at the end of that period of time, she says, I think I'm ready to go to the address now. I'm, I'm getting tired. So they pull up in front of the portico with the orderlies already waiting. They had brought out a wheelchair and they placed the frail woman in the chair. She begins to fumble in her purse, and she says, how much do I owe you? And Kent says, oh, nothing, nothing. And she says, but you've, you have to make a living. Surely I can pay you something. He says, oh, no, there'll be other passengers. And almost instinctively, he reaches down, and he gives her a hug. 
And in that moment, she says, thank you. Thank you for tonight. You gave me so much joy. There's nothing more to say. So Kent gets back into the taxi cab and he drives off and he can't seem to take any more calls for the evening. He's left alone with his thoughts and he's left alone with the thoughts that say, man, what, what would have happened if I just would have blown the horn twice and driven off? What would have happened if I hadn't have walked up to the door? What would have happened if I would have been in a bad mood and just sped her on to the facility? What would have happened if I had not have taken her past all those places and shared those moments? You see, my friends, sometimes I think that we miss these opportunities that God gives for us to give God's peace and God's joy. Sometimes we miss the golden opportunity while we're waiting for the flash of gold. <laughs> but it can be in those small acts. It can be in the refusal to be afraid, in which we show God's loving kindness to someone else. Today, this evening, we'll have another chance to another opportunity to experience the greatest story ever told in a different kind of way through the walk to Bethlehem. You see, this is a story of a just and a righteous king. It is a king that wields true justice, particularly that for those who are in the margins. It is a king that brings peace to the world, to a world gone mad. This is a story of God come to earth, wrapped in human flesh, that crosses all barriers just so that we might know him. It's in the awe of that moment, in the awe of that silence, that God's mystery is revealed the paradox of power appearing in a manger. It is a story of a God that comes to us, even us, in the stillness of the night. Just like the hymn, Silent Night, Holy Night, all is calm, all is bright. Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. Amen.